So, Gustavo, um, thank you so much for making the, the long journey from Oaxaca to, um, to Dublin to, to be with us um, today for this, um, this thinkery on the commons. Um, as you know, we have borrowed the idea of the, the thinkery um, from Ivan Illich, uh, who described the centre he established in Mexico in the, in the 60s as a thinkery. Um, so we've, we've borrowed the idea, but we're not quite sure what it is, um, <laughs> what, what he meant by it. Um, in, in, the, uh, in opening your contribution to our publication, you talk about how 25 years ago, Ivan Illich invited you um, and a group of other friends to come together to talk about the, the question after development what, um, and that subsequently led to the, the, the publication of the Development um, Dictionary. So just by way of introducing yourself to uh, some people here who may be unfamiliar with your, with your, with your work and um, your own history, um, I wonder if you could start, please, by telling us a little bit about how you came to be part of that circle of friends, um, and then also to say what you think Ivan Illich thought a thinkery might be. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, um, Ivan was uh, really famous uh, in the beginning of the 70s, the late 60s, um, with this school in society and medical nemesis, Many people were coming to visit him in Sidok in Cuernavaca, and I was living at 60 kilometers from that place. But uh, for us, in the Marxist left, uh, he was just a reactionary priest. And uh, it was not worth reading him, because we were saying, yes, of course, he's talking about the education and health. They are horrible in the capitalist society. Later, we will have a different kind of education and health. And it's not worth reading or meeting with him. Then we, uh, I have no idea of, uh, about Ivan not reading a piece of his work in the 70s. Um, but in the early 80s, uh, I was um, really lost. I was working and living at the grassroots, um, and then not understand, very happy in, in my activity, but uh, not understanding anything. Then I started, oh, because I don't know enough, then I need to study anthropology, to study economics, and the more I studied, the less I understood. Then uh, one, one day I took off the lenses of development, the lenses in which I was educated. And uh, the beginning it was like when you are dazzled and then you cannot see anything, you, you, you only see shadows, but I was really lost. Then a friend invited me for um, <coughs> a meeting. Um, it was, it, it, Ivan was not mentioned, it was Wolf and Sachs there in Mexico City. And then I was invited to discuss uh, something about the social construction of energy or something, and Ivan was there. Then when he started to speak, I, I was immediately captured by him. And, and a friend invited us for dinner. And, and then that, that night I could not sleep uh, reading furiously everything about Ivan. I think this is here one very important point about Ivan. What I discovered it is that perhaps Ivan articulates uh, better than any other person the discourse of the people. Meaning he's saying the things that the people know and are doing, people at the grassroots, ordinary men and women. Uh, whenever after that I was talking about Ivan's ideas in the villages, in the barrios, the reaction was always the aha effect. Mm -hmm. that, that they knew, that, that they knew already, and the, but they did not know how to articulate that. Mm -hmm. Then uh, a thinker is basically one element in the process of articulation, how you articulate the ideas. Uh, it's how to talk about ideas that you don't have. You cannot really say the thing because the idea is not, it is around, but it is, mm. you need to capture it. Mm. But you capture it talking with others, mm. uh, in the relation, in the interaction with others. That is one element of a uh, very important element in the, in the thinker. The other fundamental element uh, is, and, and we don't take this very much in consideration, um, SIDOC was the intercultural center of documentation. Then from the very beginning, one obsession of, of Ivan was the relation between cultures. 
uh, the basic assumption is that we have never had real dialogue between cultures. The, what we call dialogue is the imposition of one vision on the other. Mm. Then we will talk but in my terms. Mm. Uh, and then we will use my language, we will use uh, my vision, and then we w I will engage you in my conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and then how really to, to open to, to a, a real dialogue. First, the word means transcending the logos. And meaning a real conversation implies that you will put your logos in the side, I will put mine in the side, and then it's, we will see what happens. Mm -hmm. Then you are not using your rationality, your language, your vision. Uh, you, I am not using mine. And then one way of saying, it's a stupid way of saying, but it is pertinent, it is, let's see if from heart to heart we can find something, not from mind to mind. Because let's assume that our minds are fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. that, and, and we must not impose one mind on the, on the other, one rationality on the other rationality. Then he was also obsessed with uh, interculturality and with the, the dialogue, the possibility of the dialogue between different people and dialogue implying basically listening. Yes, as, as Tom says, it is mm -hmm. the point of departure is in the dialogue, you are listening to the other. But listening is not just having the words in your ear, but listening and changing, that allowing the other to change you. And all this constructed around friendship. Uh, Ivan was all the time talking about uh, his fundamental sin was polyphilia, the, the friends, the, the commitment with friends. Um, it was very difficult to be friends with Ivan because you need to have the, your luggage ready uh, because he was calling, oh, Gustavo, I am in Germany and Theodor Shanin is coming and you need, you need to come because we will have this conversation. It, it was, but he knew how to, to be friends. Uh, you were in uh, Pennsylvania with him and uh, suddenly he canceled everything, all the lectures, the seminars, all the group of people that were <coughs> with him because a woman called some from Switzerland and uh, told him, Ivan, uh, I am dying, and uh, before dying, I want to see you. Please come. And then he canceled everything. He flew to Switzerland and spent the last 20 days of the life of this woman with her. Uh, that is to be friends. Mm. It, it is really this profound connection. And um, perhaps, and I think this is very pertinent for a thinker, um, in the last years of his life, he was saying all the time, now I know who I am because I can see myself in the eyes of my friends. This is really the way to think. When you discover yourself in the eyes of your friend, it's, it's, not, it's no longer your construction, your individual construction, mm. but seeing yourself in, in the other of course, with the element of, of friendship. This is, uh, I'm just remembering the explanation of um, hospitality that you gave last night, um, mm -hmm. which was accepting the otherness of the, uh, of the other. It, it was again with, with Ivan, how, how this came. It was the first conversation in Cuernavaca in Ocotepec for this, he invited some friends. Matthias Ranema was there, Jan Robert was there. There were several of us in the, And then at one moment, Ivan said, Gustavo, uh, if you have only one word to speak, what is to be beyond development? What's the word will, you will use? And then what came immediately to my mind was hospitality. It okay. is really, it's when you don't have this vision, this is the good life, this is the idea, we all should achieve this kind of, yeah. of life. Okay. Hospitality is be opening to the others. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say something that I think is also pertinent for a discussion today. Um, tolerance, it's of course very important to be tolerant in these times of intolerance that we have everywhere. And, and clearly development is very intolerant. But tolerance, if you see the dictionary, to tolerate is to suffer with patience. And then the, the person that tolerates uh, is, is saying, okay, you are not the right way. You are underdeveloped, you are black, you are whatever. But I am so generous that I will tolerate you. 
and uh, get to say that uh, to tolerate is to insult. Uh, you are really dismissing the other by tolerating him or her. Mm. And then uh, hospitality, it's not tolerance. Mm. It is really opening your arms and your heart and your stomach and everything to the otherness of the other. Mm. And not accepting or tolerating the difference, but celebrating the difference. Related to that, could I just ask you um, to um, comment on a few other terms that you use that are associated with Illich um, and that you use in, in your discussion of, of the commons? Well, one is, again, by way of introducing yourself, where you, are, where you describe yourself as a, a deprofessionalized intellectual. Mm. Um, and um, I know some people have asked me, what does he mean by that? So I thought it might be good to ask you that, related to his idea of um, disabling professionals. Mm -hmm. But then also to say a word about this really central notion of conviviality. Okay. <coughs> uh, well, um, when, with the, when we are talking about deprofessionalization, we are saying two kinds of things. In the experience of many of us, to de -learn, de learn what we learned has been the most difficult part of our learning. It is not learning something new, but we have been constructed in a certain way, in a professional way. Uh, and this de learning, that professional thinking, mm -hmm. Is, is very, very difficult because in a very real sense, it is how you are shaped and then you are losing yourself when you are deprofessionalizing yourself. Uh, we, we don't see the profession, how the profession really shape us. Uh, every profession has a specific language <laughs> and the words are uh, the doors and, and windows uh, uh, to the world is how, depending on the words you use, it's how you experience the world. And then, if you are shaped with professional words, uh, your being is a profession. And then you don't see that your eyes are not your eyes, are the eyes of the profession. Then, you, you, then to to dismantle that is to dismantle yourself. It's very challenging. And we are we are talking about that, trying to to reclaim our beings beyond the specific shape of, of a profession. But the other aspect it is also uh, in the idea is uh, really starting a very serious struggle against the dictatorship of the professions, of the different professions. Uh, they are really disabling professions. That, that magnificent article of Ivan saying this age can be described as the age of disabling professions in which every profession is constructed to disable the other people. Um, when, uh, when there is a usual saying, saying one professional is one kind of expert that can transform any situation into a problem and he is always in the solution. I'm using the he in a very uh, specific way because it is a clearly uh, patriarchal <laughs> position. It is the he, the professional should be a he. A woman should become a he to become a professional, really. Mm -hmm. it, it is the way the things are, are shaped. Um, and then it is this professional that imposes himself and disables the other person. Uh, no, you don't know how, are feeling, how you are feeling. I know how you are feeling. I, I, I am the expert, I am the professional. I, I will tell you how you are feeling. Um, and th this is, uh, if, if you, um, there is now in, uh, in uh, seven American universities a new professional uh, that is the bereavement counselor. Uh, it is the people that have suffered the loss of a, of a loved one and uh, he or she does not know how to feel what is the pertinent thing to feel. And then this counselor will tell him, tell her, uh, now you, you lost your mother, you lost your mother, then you must, it's okay to feel this or that thing, not this other thing, that, that's not okay. This, to feel this, it's, it's okay. And how you will express? Well, uh, this is, first, it was the consequence of previous disabling. It was really, disabling the, the, the way you are, the way you feel, the, the, the professionals are telling you what to do. And this is, of course, a perfect uh, education 
for consumers. Then you are educated to consume everything, including the services of the professionals. Uh, well, this is what we are trying to say when we are saying that we are deprofessionalized. We are saying the two things, to de-learn our being as professionals and to challenge all the professions. And um, the connecting this with uh, conviviality, of course, uh, you know, any person that can read tools for conviviality can read the explanation of Ivan that he took the word from Bria Saverian, that it was about gastronomy. It's, uh, he is fully aware that uh, the word is used today um, to talk about um, uh, tipsy uh, hauling. It's, it's just, just something that you have in the pub. It's uh, the people drinking and, and mm -hmm. having this uh, convivial. Uh, but he is trying to give the word a completely a new meaning I think it's also pertinent, this is not Ivan, but uh, I think how we can escape from the Humpty Dumpty syndrome. Um, you, you know this story of Alice in Wonderland? And, and then Humpty Dumpty tells uh, Alice, uh, oh, let's have a language in which every, pers every word means whatever the person using it wants. Oh, great, say Alice. That is magnificent. That is real freedom and creativity. And then we will invent all the meanings of the words. Then um, Alice stops and says, oh, but how we will understand each other? Is, is, is every word has the meaning of, of the person. And then Humpty Dumpty answers, uh, the question is, who is in power here? That will be, at the end, the, the meaning of, of, of the word. Then uh, what we are trying to do, and this is, um, yesterday it was mentioned very importantly, we, we are today um, one of the main challenges. If we talk about the crisis of imagination, this implies reinventing our uh, words, mm -hmm. trying to create a new, a new language, and trying to create in such a way that it's not a technical meaning, it is not the professionals imposing uh, the new meaning in the words, that is what they usually do. Uh, all the science, it is basically colonizing our language. Uh, Ivan was talking all the time about the amoeba words, that uh, it was how our language is colonizing, colonized because of these words as leftovers of science, mm. falling into normal uh, conversation to mean nothing. There are many, many, many words that you are using all the time and means really nothing. They are monumental emptiness. It's, uh, they are now games. You can, you can put uh, magnificent words like uh, sex, structure, problem. Uh, all these words mean absolutely nothing. Uh, you, you can construct, uh, they, they are magnificent uh, words for a lecture. Um, the, sexual, the structure of the sexual problems. Uh, this, this kind of, of, of talk is meaning nothing. You're, you're saying absolutely nothing. Then we need to reclaim our words, to reclaim our meanings, and this Ivan was clearly a genius for that. And then he gave to conviviality a, a new meaning. Very importantly, he was talking conviviality applied to tools, not to people. Mm -hmm. It is not about the relation between people but how the people use the tools. Then it, you can have convivial tools as uh, the opposite to industrial tools. And how the industrial tools uh, are leading us to the world of systems in which we become subsystems of the systems. And then we can no longer use the tools for our intentions, but the tools use us for their intentions. Uh, this, this kind of things. Then if you have convivial tools, the tools cannot use you, and you can use the tools. And then he used the word austerity with a completely a different meaning of the modern meaning of, of, of the word. Mm -hmm. As the, the person using convivial tools as austerity is austere. Austere that implying eliminating all the tools he was uh, talking about techno-fasting, 
meaning fasting about the use of certain technologies, affecting your relations with others. You cannot be with your friends in the proper way. He, he loved one, one story one I was telling once a few years ago. Uh, I was called by a woman uh, saying, Gustavo, please come and help me to destroy my phone. Okay, you don't need me. You can just dance on your phone and that's it. No, no, no. I want you to tell me to dismantle the whole possibility of having a phone at home. Oh, that was very interesting. Then I came immediately. <laughs> what is this? What is the idea? And, and then I asked immediately in, in her house, uh, what's the purpose? What, what is what you want? I want to see my children. She said, what? She said, Yes, I, I refused to have a phone for many years. But then I was uh, out in a holiday, uh, and then when I came back, I had a whole uh, phone in my, in my home. Then during the last month, all my five children have been calling me every day for a long conversation in the phone, but I'm not seeing them. Mm. I, I want to see them and to touch them and to feed them, to, to have here at home. And then the phone, and for that woman was really preventing the relation with the, with the others. And you can see now on the internet, four guys with a cellular in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. They're not talking to each other, yeah. but talking to, to, to the cellular. And, and then you are using all these technology that are interfering with our, our personal interaction. And, and there is a very important point uh, when he introduces tools for conviviality. He, he's saying this austerity this peculiar virtue. It's not uh, depriving us of all the enjoyment of wine and uh, women or men, depending on your preference. Uh, it is not depriving of your interaction with others. Uh, it is the virtue that includes basically eutrapelia, he said, that is graceful playfulness in your interaction with others. It's, it's beautiful, mm -hmm. graceful playfulness in the interaction. Uh, this is, again, one expression of, of friendship and how you interact with others in a way that is, that is conviviality. Okay. The, well, maybe let's use the, your discussion there of austerity, of the notion of austerity, to move on to the to the, talking about the commons, because I know in, in your piece you talk about um, commoners as austere people. Um, and this is very different to the, the understanding of austerity that we have now, where it's yes, associated policies. with the, well, I think the, what, the t-shirt the IMF to you too, you know, <laughs> um, that that's the, the association we have with, with, um, with austerity. But just to, to, to talk about this idea of the commons, um, last night Eilish uh, talked about how many years ago she read uh, your, your entry in the, um, in, in the development dictionary and I too remember reading it and um, really responding to it because it helped me understand my irritation with the, you know, the idea of, <coughs> well, for many, you know, Ireland being portrayed as um, a late developer, you know, so I, I, I understood that um, and really relished that argument, but the, the call to celebrate the commons was one I didn't really understand, um, and it's uh, only through working on this publication with, with Mary and Tom that I've, begin, I've begun to understand, begun to <coughs> cleanse my gaze, as you uh, called to us to, to do. But um, so you, you, you call on us to both celebrate the commons, but also you call on us to be wary about this, this, this notion. Um, and um, you, you have, so maybe if you could tell us about your reservations about the term the commons, please. Uh, yeah, it was first uh, how I started to use uh, the conversations uh, with, with Ivan about development, what is to be beyond development, uh, were in the late 80s, when the idea of post-development was already fashionable. Mm -hmm. uh, there were conferences about uh, what is to be beyond development, uh, the, the awareness that development was a total failure, uh, and then we were discussing uh, beyond development uh, in the late 80s. And then in the, when we decided to share our conversations for three years, uh, then we wanted to, in every one of the essays in which we were dismantling 
the semantic constellation of, of development. We wanted in every essay uh, to present the critique and then the way out. Then, okay, we are dismantling this word, then, then what? Mm -hmm. uh, and then my uh, essay was about development itself. Then the way out was, and, and the, 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 my immediate reaction, uh, like with hospitality, was the way out is the commons. And the commons, but the commons puzzling me about the meaning of the commons, because commons cannot be translated to Spanish. Uh, it, it is next to impossible to find a word that is really equivalent uh, to, to commons in, in Spanish. And then um, I, I was fully aware uh, by them that about the commons was the enclosure of the commons and the very pertinent and appropriate description of the enclosure of the commons as the beginning of capitalism by, by Marx and, and uh, all, all these ideas around, around the commons. But the most important point was that in the late 80s, we had already in the world a very important movement around the commons. Meaning this is not now, it is something that was already there in the late 80s. What we were seeing everywhere beyond development was this movement, reclaiming the commons or regenerating the commons. People reclaiming what they lost during the enclosure or those that were able to keep them how they were resisting and regenerating them. Then my, my, my piece on development really ends saying this is a call to celebrate this movement, to, to see what is happening. Uh, they are basically invisible. Let's try to open our, our eyes and to celebrate and to do some, some research uh, about what is this, what is happening, what kind of world is emerging with the commons. And then, but very challenging, saying we, I, I am convinced that we cannot really use the word. It's beautiful. Uh, of course, uh, Nick Dyer now convert, transformed the idea in a very clear possibility. Uh, we are talking about communism. Yes, that's beautiful, great. Yes, here you are playing with the word and then you are constructing this, going beyond communism and then trying to create communism. And then, but uh, it is uh, clearly a very Anglo-Saxon uh, notion. Uh, that the commons is not a universal category. Uh, it is something that belongs to one specific tradition. And then we need to have not one word, not to have this is the word that will be really universal, but accepting from the very beginning that we will have a family of words that includes very different traditions. Then instead of, of trying to, to, to have finally I discovered the word that will be the standard category from now on, mm -hmm. that, that will be the new cell of the society, then uh, we are saying that beyond in the modern society in capitalism, you have the individual and the commodity as the basic cells of the operation of the society, the individual and the commodity, and the commodity including, of course, um, use value, surplus value, uh, uh, change value, and all, the, all these different elements um, to define the social relations associated with capitalism. Then we are clearly saying that the commons is the cell of the new society, that it's going beyond capitalism, you have this new cell that is the commons, but not one cell, it's not one category. It's not the commons. It is just, it is a good clue to begin the exploration, to find the family of words that we will finally accept. As this family of words, will, uh, we will celebrate the difference of many different cultures that have constructed different ways of being that are clearly beyond capitalism. Mm. Perhaps we can later discuss that perhaps we cannot use uh, the word, I, I find uh, the um, not thinking about an old idea, uh, it, it's perfect, it's beautiful, but I am not sure if you are recovering the old idea mm. or doing something radically new, that it is commoning, this, this thing that we are talking about, it's, it's today. Mm. It is not going back in history. Mm. Mm. It's not trying to reconstruct what the commons were. It's something really very, very, very new. 
And then what, what we need to, to explore is what is the kind of novelties that we are having all over the, the planet. It's not the commons. It's not one conception. It's not one shape. It's not one vision. Mm. It is many people are creating many different things that have some resemblance, but they are not the same. One thing that um, Mary, Tom, and I became increasingly aware of when we were working on this um, publication was the um, was the, the family of traditions of thinking about the commons um, and the the many internal debates that are taking place within the, the commons movement. Um, and in, in your piece, you're um, very critical of one tradition, and the tradition associated with um, Eleanor Ostrom, who won the, the Nobel uh, Prize for Economics for her work on the commons. Um, you say that she is ignorant and naive and has a poor understanding of history um, um, and that she still operates within a, an economic mentality. Um, so um, could you tell us a little bit more about yeah. that, please? It's a problem to speak about uh, uh, Eleanor because she was really very, very sweet lady, uh, very soft, very gentle. It, it, it was... Uh, uh, it's hard to criticize uh, her in such a way, <laughs> dismissing her in such a way, but it was very difficult to interact uh, with, with her. Uh, she invited me to her seminar um, in Bloomington, and uh, she was the god there. She, she has the group of people, that are the followers, uh, studying with, the, with her, um, be, even before the Nobel Prize. Um, she was the queen in the, in the seminar. But she was really amazingly ignorant, uh, even in economics. She was not an economist. And then she was uh, working with categories, using the words without knowing the meaning of the words. Uh, really, with, with amazing ignorance. And, and then she was uh, very sure about what she was doing, uh, lost in the forest. <laughs> she was really lost. Uh, she, she was ignoring all the all the things, the complexity of the things that she was with, with uh, that she was working in, on, on this, with an of a peculiar obsession with efficiency. Uh, she loved the commons. She really loved them. Uh, she found them marvelous. Uh, she wanted to to really care for them. A good part of her exploration was with uh, Hardin. It was yes. She accepted for I think for many many years the tragedy, and then she was trying to work to prevent the tragedy. Then, if we leave the commons as they are, they will end tragically. Mm. That the Harding is right that that it will end that that way. Mm. Uh, when I met her, she did not know, for example, that Harding at the end of his, of his life. Acknowledge it. Oh, oh, sorry, I was wrong. Uh, yes, that is not uh, the commons. That is the regime of, uh, of free access that we have all over the world. That is the tragedy of the regime of the free access. Mm -hmm. That is what happens in the regime of free access. But she did not know about that. Mm. She was challenging Harding, but without knowing that Harding himself acknowledged it, uh, his great mistake. Uh, you're particularly critical of the way she uses the word resource and where she talks about the commons as a resource. And I think, you know, many people think of the commons in terms of natural resources like forests and sea. It is clear. Um, Ivan, uh, I think, was the first uh, who says, uh, said this, but Vandana Shiva expresses this very well in the dictionary. Um, when you destroy the commons, the, the commons becomes resources. It is resources is clearly the opposite of the commons. Then instead of being the commons, you have a group of resources. Uh, then uh, the, the common land becomes the resource for someone that will use that resource for specific purposes. Then uh, if you see the commons as resources, you are really destroying them. And that is why Eleanor is our enemy. <laughs> because what she was doing, the, the expression was a common expression in that time. 
she was using something used by many other people, common pool resources was the, the pertinent word to talk about these kind of things. They were not using the word commons, but common pool resources. Mm -hmm. They were seeing this as a collection of resources that were administered by a group of people. It's more or less in the cooperative tradition that she loved this, this idea of cooperation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she, she was trying to, one of uh, her fundamental concerns is, you know, in capitalism you need competition then how will we will bring competition inside the common pool, the administration of common pool resources? Because if you bring competition, then they will compete with each other and that they will destroy the whole idea, then it will be the tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. Then how you can accept competi competition, because competition is very important, it's very good. Uh, you, you must not avoid competition, but trying to control competition and to organize competition in such a way that will not destroy the administration of the common pool resources. Then uh, I, I think that um, uh, Mrs. Ostrom, um, I think that um, she got the Nobel Prize in economics because what she was doing really was to try to economize the commons. And, and the nature of the commons, there is something that is beyond the economy. And, and, and then he, what she was really doing was trying to perceive the commons, to construct the commons, to organize the commons in an economic way, with the premise of scarcity. Um, that is, th there are many problems with uh, Mrs. Austin, okay. but this is some of the main problems about her work. One of the other controversies within um, the commons movement centers around the state um, and the role of the, the nation state. And your approach um, calls for a radical refusal um, um, to engage in the whole reform process. Um, that you, you, you see the state, the nation state as a lost cause. Um, you talk about um, democratic despotism. Um, I know for, for many people that's, uh, well, many people who are involved in efforts to salvage elements of the welfare state, um, who see the welfare state as having been um, involving a series of hard-won victories. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Yeah. Well, uh, first, as an introduction about that concern, it's an epistemological uh, question. Um, we, we all know that it's the value of abstraction. But from the very beginning, Plato was uh, warning us about uh, the problem with abstraction. Abstraction means to take something away from reality here is the reality, then I take from reality something out of reality and put it in my mind. Uh, in that operation, uh, once Plato, we need to be very careful. And he, he does not use this word, but it is you need to put uh, this abstraction within brackets to establish a clear difference between reality and what you have in the mind, because the abstraction is not the reality. It's something that you took away from reality. And then apparently what happened, particularly in the West, is that we lost the brackets. That was the first place. We, we started to create confusion about abstraction and reality. But the next step was terrible. It is, the next step is we started to believe that the abstraction that we have in the mind is the real reality that uh, through the senses you are perceiving something that is Perhaps you can an optic illusion. You, 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 the, the, this can be confusing. You are not really perceiving the reality. But the abstraction is the reality. And then you assume that this abstraction is the real thing. Um, perhaps the, the worst kind of example is uh, that magnificent contribution of Marx about the class struggle. And uh, then it is really a magnificent light to see reality and to see what is happening in capitalism. But uh, then the people assumed that you have the classes in the reality. The classes, that is a very powerful abstraction. Mm -hmm. uh, in the real world, 
It is the people struggling, not the classes. You cannot see and touch the class struggling. And then the people try to construct class organizations, for example. That is terrible, that is clearly counterproductive. Well, all this kind of consideration of how we, you, we are educated in a way that we take for real abstract entities. Something that can be very convenient for a conversation, for a convention, and then to say, yes, uh, um, I live in Mexico and you live in Ireland. It's convenient, it's a point of reference. But it's not real. We cannot live in abstract entities. We cannot live in Ireland uh, or planet Earth. After the blue bubble, we, we all think we live on planet Earth. We cannot live on planet Earth. Planet Earth is an abstraction. Then. All, all this is a prelude to talk about three, these three ghosts, the state, the nation, uh, democracy. It is really very vague notions. Uh, you, you cannot really find a good definition, standard definition of any of these three things. Uh, you always find a, a kind of definition that it is uh, how to escape from it. Uh, still the typical definition of uh, democracy for our eternal shame is the political regime now existing in the United States. You, you can find that in many textbooks. What is democracy? That specific political regime. Because yes, it was modern democracy was invented, created in the United States. Uh, one part of the story, it's, it's really very clear. When you see the creation of the United States and the process for the invention of the United States, uh, there is a discussion among the people inventing the United States, the Federalists and Hamilton and Madison and all of them talking terrible things against democracy. I say, we cannot have that kind of stupid regime because we will not have the American Union. We cannot have this. This is, this is horrible. This is impossible. What we need to have is a republic. A republic is a system that creates the illusion of democracy in the people, but there are always a group of people that really control the power and control and dominate the people, can lead the people in a certain way. That is what we need. This, they created the republic, and then the party for this was the republicans, trying to argue for this specific system, creating the illusion of democracy, but not democracy. And then for many years, it lasted many, many years. It was only at the end of the 19th century when they started to use democracy, and then the republic was called a democracy, and later that was the model of democracy for everyone. And, and, and you create a nation state that was a specific political regime created for the administration of capitalism and for the control of the people, for the domination of the people, for the administration of capital, that was the, the basic element and the design of the nation state. And then you apply to that nation state the notion of democracy, that it is a system of control of the people, not of participation of the people. If you accept as a definition of democracy this idea that the people really participate in the decisions affecting their lives. Uh, and the people can remove, can change, can control the people administering their decisions, then you really don't have democracy in any country on earth. It has never existed. The most important point is that all the nation states have been constructed in the constitution, in the whole legal, legal system, to prevent the people from interfering with the regime of uh, the, the operation of the decision makers. The decision makers should be protected from the people. The people cannot really interfere with them. If you see the, the, the mandate, uh, your representatives in a democracy, it is your representatives. You elect them, supposedly, in democratic elections. Well, they are protected from you. They are servants of the nation. Of what? What is that lady? Where is, where is she? The, the nation? They, they, they are accounted to the nation when, when the representatives, they are not uh, accountable for the people, 
for the people electing them. They, they, all the laws are protecting them from the interference of the people. Mm. The people have the sacred right of asking. This is the first Ameri amendment in the American Constitution. The people can come together to ask. That is the fundamental civil right. But if the people have the right to ask, the authorities have the right to say no, to refuse, to ignore the people, to don't take into consideration the people. Then all, all this, um, it is not our struggle against the state. Uh, it is not our struggle against democracy. It's not our struggle against nation. They're saying these are ghosts. This is something that we, you cannot find against this ghost. This is not our fight. When you are saying, I am against the nation, what are you talking about? You are fighting against what? I am against the state. You are fighting against what? Uh, yes, as Marx could say in the, uh, studying the Paris Commune, yes, we need to dismantle all these apparatuses created in the name of the state and the nation. Yes, we did to dismantle these kind of things. And to dismantle these kind of things, I, I think this is, all this construction is to, to say this. You need to destroy the need of these apparatuses. I mean, it's not new ludism. It is not trying to say, okay, destroy the machines. Mm. It is not to destroy the social security or the army, or to destroy all these institutions. Let's try to destroy the need of them. That is what, what and that is something that you can dismantle very easily. Mm. Any community, any group of people can destroy the need of that kind of thing. Okay, just before we open the floor to general questions, if I can just ask you one more, say returning to your comments just now on, on the idea of class, um, but also around how we conceive of the struggle. Um, just before we started, uh, you mentioned that in the, the various contributions to the, the supplement, um, which reflect, we hope, different traditions of commoning, the one that you feel uh, furthest removed from is the um, what has been um, described as the anti-capitalist commons and the, the article by Silvia Federici and, and George Capensis that we're going to be discussing um, in, in our, our small groups later on. Can you tell us some of like the, um, now you see it as a, as a common effort to, uh, to understand the, the, the struggle, but what, um, what are the points where you feel a difference with what they're saying? Um, first, I would say um, Sylvia and George are my friends, uh, and then we are very close in many different ways. Uh, and I love the, the way Sylvia has been struggling for mm. women, for example, the question mm. of, of gender. Uh, she, she knows that she was wrong at, at some time in what she was asking, but the basic struggle of Sylvia is marvelous. And, and, and by the way, uh, how George is now dealing with the question of death can be very interesting for Ireland. How, we are very, very close. If, if someone asks me, are you ready to sign a manifesto of Sylvia and George uh, without seeing it, I will sign it without seeing it because I really trust them. Uh, we are very close. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I am clearly in radically um, very contrasting position about almost everything they are saying in the article here. Uh, and, and, uh, but uh, the, the, the point would be, and perhaps we can go and see that later in seeing that, that article, in discussing that, that article, uh, the, the way they are talking about uh, the commons and uh, the anti-capitalist commons and these kind of things, the words they're using, the, the, how they approach the, the whole thing uh, are clearly completely different of uh, my own experience, of my own perception. But uh, then what I would like to say is how we can uh, accept in our discussion these divergent views. It's not my position will not be they are wrong, I am right. Uh, 
uh, it is not that Sylvia and George committed a very serious mistake and then I will uh, go with them and I will write to them saying, uh, George, Sylvia, you are wrong because of this and this and this and I have very solid arguments saying, oh, Mira, you look, that this is a stupid. Sylvia, please, why you are <laughs> writing these stupid, very stupid things? And, and I, can, I can really elaborate very well an argument against uh, everything they are writing in that, in that piece. But th th this is perhaps not the proper approach for our discussion. It, it is saying perhaps uh, we are having opposite views, very different views, and both of us are right. Uh, perhaps the question is how they are seeing the world uh, in New England. How in that specific world you see the world in a certain way. And then they perceive the commons and they have this reflection in that specific world. And of course, the world in New England is radically different to the world in, in Chiapas and the Zapatistas mm -hmm. and the indigenous people and, 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 and the movements in Latin America. It's a different planets. Mm -hmm. And then if you are discussing these kind of things in these different worlds, then you have different perceptions. Which returns us to the idea of hospitality. Of Do course, you embrace that is, the otherness of that, their... That is, again, and then again, Ivan. Uh, Ivan uh, was saying time and again, through arguments you can only get conclusions. Uh, only stories make sense. Yes, th th that is the point. Yeah. Then if you see the Sylvia and George uh, as a, not a collection of arguments, but a story, mm -hmm. the, the story they are telling about their own reality, then that is a story that makes sense for them, mm -hmm. but they don't make sense for us. This is not the commons or the common we are talking about. Okay, thank you. Maybe that's a really good point at which to open up this conversation. Anybody like to start? Um, I don't know if I uh, made this up quite possible, but uh, back in some years ago, I was in a uh, university in Galway there in a philosophy course. A um, lot of information, but anyway, I think I came across a notion there from Aristotle at one point that uh, he was describing the method of, of, of rule of the people. Uh, he was saying, characterizing, kind of saying that there are, there are two types of the initial rule. The rule uh, for the common good and then the rule based on self-interest. And the rule for the common good uh, defines one individual male as a king, or the rule based on self-interest defines one individual male as a tyrant. Uh, the same applies for uh, the individual, of course. Um, and then he worked down the line and he said, if everybody has equal participation in society and everybody rules for the common good, it's called politics. But if everybody rules based on self-interest, it's called democracy. So the logical consequence in that situation would be that a democracy creates nested aristocracies, people whose mutualized self-interest for the control of the people around them creates the structures of power that we'd be familiar with still at this time. And so democracy has always been a farce um, from its original meaning. Now, I don't know if I made this up. I cannot figure out if I actually like this. Sure, I wrote this down somewhere back in the day, you know, but I can't remember uh, where, where it came from. It's really a mystery to me. But uh, I think there's something in this. I don't know if we can react. Um, uh, it's not your invention, but it is your distortion. Um, in one specific uh, sense, there is something like that in Aristotle, very clearly, but we need to remember. Uh, that uh, many times we are colonizing the past with our categories. Uh, the individual, as we know what is an individual, did not exist in the time of Aristotle. Then he is not really talking about the self-interest of an individual because that is, he could not conceive that possibility. Uh, he, he could not uh, imagine what is an individual in the modern meaning of the term. Uh, a thing that uh, Illich has clearly demonstrated that uh, the individual was born in the 12th century uh, with the invention of the text and, and that many other things. 
then uh, when we talk about uh, self-interest in the time of Aristotle and, uh, and the common good in the time of Aristotle, just the common good is the idea of politics, that, 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 that is the original meaning of the word politics. It's not about parties, it is the common good of, of the whole city. Uh, then Aristotle was very explicitly against the idea of democracy. Um, because of the danger of uh, demagoguery. In, in the case, in a democratic society, it's the worst kind of political regime, said Aristotle. That, that is clearly in, in, in Aristotle. But when he talks about self-interest, it's not self-interest of an individual self. That, that, that is, but that is, of course, we, we need a whole day to discuss <laughs> that, that point. It's just a clue to the kind of exploration that you can continue after this. We've had a lot of discussion over the past two days about the notion of the, the individual. And l last night, I know, was part of a, a, a conversation over the glass of wine um, at the reception yesterday. Um, you were talking about the distinction between um, uh, collect a, a collective um, or the idea, you know, that the, the limitations of the notion of collective, because it's a, a collection of individuals. Of individuals, of individuals. Um, and that um, com uh, common uh, communism goes beyond that. It, 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 it it's, this is, of course, one of the most challenging elements. It is h how we can accept that we are constructed as individuals. And then we can see the world as individuals, we can experience the world as individuals, but we cannot be individuals. We, we cease to be humans the very moment in which we try to be individuals. We, we, it's a specific construction and, and, and a social construction, a very strong social construction, that is very destructive, that is destroying us, destroying our possibilities of being by, by being constructed in, in that specific way. Um, but perhaps one, again, one, one story can illustrate the, the point better than a complex argument. Perhaps you have heard about one Dr. Spock uh, that produced a very solid book about your son. It's basically for people that don't have the, the experience of how to raise a child. Uh, and then he wrote this magnificent book with an amazing index in which they, you, you, you have the baby and then you don't know what to do with the baby. And you go to the index and the index says, oh, the sheet is a little yellow with a little green. Oh, that is the meaning of the sheet the yellow and the sheet <laughs> green. And, and, and this is the kind of things. Well, that marvelous book, uh, very useful for, for uh, raising babies, um, has for the first six editions uh, the commandments of Dr. Spock. Uh, the, the, the Ten Commandments are, are really amazing. The first three commandments are the important points. First commandment, parents' bed is forbidden territory. Children should never be in the parents' bed. Second commandment, it is very good for the children that they should have their own room as soon as possible, if possible the very day they come back from the hospital, have their own room in isolation. Third commandment, the best for the physical and, and psychological development of the children is for them to cry for half an hour a day alone. And, and, and you, you were seeing that time, uh, some mothers say, oh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, I, yeah. I cannot stand it, this any, anymore. Then these many uh, children were constructed like that. It is the construction of an individual mm. separated from the others and from the world. Uh, and this is very good for them, for the physical and mental development. And, and that they are really separated. And you now have, you, you know the technology, it's in, in almost in every house with, the, with children in the United States, in which you have the technology to hear mm. uh, the, the baby crying in every place in the, in the, in the house. Can you see the difference if you go to Mexico or India and you see that magnificent um, tool of the shawl, uh, and the, the, the rebozo in, in our case, and, and then uh, the babies are 
next to the uh, body of the mother for many months, the, the, the whole day they are there. And it's not only uh, being symbiotically attached to the mother, but they are participating in all the activities in the community. Be because the baby is here in the back and the mother is going here and there. I have seen the Zapatista communities how the children are playing football with the baby in the back. <laughs> and the babies are enjoying that like mad, <laughs> jumping and going around, etc. This is really a we. A, a we, we are we. Uh, Ramon Panikar said this very beautiful. We are knots in nets of relations. Behind, we can use the word persona. Person in the original meaning is the mask in the theater. Use it in Rome and, and Greece. It's the mask. Then behind this mask of an individual mammal, what I am is a knot in a net of relations. We, are, we all are carrying that net of relations. Sometimes this net is very poor. It's only a few people uh, in these communities that is incredibly rich. Y you are not only in a net of many, many different kinds of relations, and you are carrying these relations all, all the time. Um, in the modern world, we are always treated as individuals, not as persons with all the reach of our relations. We are separated, classified, treated as individuals. Um, but in thinking in the we, and again connected with the band, we need to see the we as a verb. Mm. And in the real world of these communities, and for our common, mm. we can see that the basic idea is weing, weing all the time. Learning inspired by these communities, uh, the Tojolabales don't. Uh, one of the Mayas, they don't have the word, a word, any word for I and you. They cannot say I. That there is not word for that. If Orla and I are talking, there is one we. If we include Tom, that is a different we, and then include the rest of people in this room, that is a different we. They they have like uh, dozens of we's. But all the time, every we, it's weing. It, it, it is a verb. It's an active verb. It's, it, is, it is, I am not talking. I am involved with you in a conversation. It is not Gustavo Esteban addressing Orla Donovan. It is weing. It is in the moment I am talking, that is a we. In downtown Mexico City, you remember yesterday I was mentioning Tepito, this specific uh, uh, neighborhood, very peculiar neighborhood. They use Spanish, but a very peculiar Spanish that only the Tepitians understand because every phrase is incomplete because it depends on the other. I, mean, I, I am saying something that you are uh, completing my, my phrase. It, it is not really... I am not telling you something, but I am winging with you the conversation. This is the kind of language they, they, they have. It's very peculiar. And, and for a foreigner, it's impossible to understand that kind of Spanish mm -hmm. because it is, it is really winging. They are winging all the time. In, in this, in downtown Mexico City, the monster of 25 million people, they are winging. They are, they are still alive and well, flourishing in, in this idea of the commons. Yes, th this is a central element of the whole conversation. Rosie. Um, I'm not sure if I actually kind of heard it correctly or understood it correctly, but we were talking about um, class politics and class um, struggle. You were, you were saying how, uh, how, very impressive, um, how very impressive Marx's analysis of class struggle was it an abstraction, but in the attempt to turn it into a reality, that kind of awful sort of things were done. On, is that roughly what you were saying? Yeah, I, I, and I suppose what I was thinking about then was, in context where you're describing like in Mexico where maybe the notion of community is more immediate to people or where it's more easily understood that the talk about commoning or community seems less of an abstraction. There's less of a movement between the reality and the kind of intellectual idea. But in a context like 
example, that I'm more familiar with, where the notion of community can't be taken for granted at all, um, where it would have to be people are quite atomized and would have to actively enter some kind of creation of community. How could you avoid that? How could, how could you avoid having some kind of an abstraction to work towards? And why would it be better or worse than what Marx is talking about in terms of class struggle? Um, and I suppose kind of going through that is, why is community better than class in terms of an identifier? What's the inherent value of community over class? Um, and secondly, how can you, when you're living in imperfect circumstances, ever avoid some level of abstraction? Hmm. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, it is, uh, um, it's of course, magnificent uh, understanding of the point. And uh, this uh, allows me to clarify that, of course, I am not against abstractions. And, for example, the abstraction of class struggle. But uh, knowing what exactly is an abstraction, a good abstraction, a powerful abstraction, a pertinent abstraction, is a powerful light illuminating the reality. Then if I use this category of Marx, class struggle, then I can illuminate the reality, the social reality in which we, we are, and we can see better what is happening here in the reality thanks to this light. Yes, most of the time, I think all of the time, we cannot really avoid the, the abstractions. We are using the abstractions. Uh, you, you cannot live without these kind of abstractions, but not mixing them with the reality, but using the abstractions to illuminate your path, to illuminate the, the, the reality. Then, yes, clearly, I, I will say, Class struggle, uh, it's a very powerful light in a capitalist society. I, I could say that the people in the communities, they never use the word community. For them, it is not an abstraction, it's a way of being. Uh, it is not that they live in a community. It is not that they are part of a community. Because if you talk about, I am part of a community, I belong to a community, then you are an individual part of that whole. Uh, that, that is not the case. The community in their case is not an abstraction, but it is the first layer of your being. Before being a person, a singular person, you are the community. And even in, in the conversation with them, you, you always hear that. Uh, who, who are you? I am San Pablo Etla. Uh, they, 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 they react saying, first, the first layer of the, of the being. That is why they can have migration and they live 20 years uh, out of the community, but they are still connected with the community and they come back to the community because they, they have this here, that this is the first layer of your, of your being. You, you are the community. And um, by, by the way, we can explore uh, today how we can reclaim this way of being abandoning the very foolish separation of uh, mind and body and us and nature. It's uh, to reconnect with nature. It's not really me reconnecting with nature, but seeing that I am nature. And I am, this sounds paranoid, I am the universe. I am everything. I am the rocks and the mountains and I am when, uh, when we, we can illustrate this saying, the air that you have in your lungs right now, it's you or not you? It really being lost to you, or uh, uh, it's nature or it is you? No, no, it's the same. We, we are not separated. This, this idea of separation is, is absurd. It's, it's an absurd construction. Yes, we, we are not, we are using the abstractions and I think we can classify the abstractions. Uh, just this powerful light illuminating the reality, and those that can be incarnated abstractions. Uh, for example, you have a peasant selecting the seeds for the next crop. And you can see it's a very, a very quickly operation. I take this, and I take this, and I take this, these specific seeds. What is this operation? It is thousands of years of experience are deposited in his practice. And then he's selecting this seed because that seed belongs to the category in the case of that. Or this other seed is in the case of that specific pest. 
he's selecting a variety of, of, of seeds, then the collection of abstractions done through the experience of millennia are deposited in this sky, in which every seed that he selects represents a category, an abstract category of seeds. But these abstractions are incarnated in, in that operation, that connection of this guy with, with the seeds. Then you, you, you can have this difference between just class struggle, it's the light on the reality, and then the incarnated abstractions. When through the experience of abstraction, uh, you have now a specific uh, wisdom, a specific uh, knowledge, a specific... Uh, Foucault has a very beautiful expression to talk about what we are talking in this, in this moment. When he said, we can uh, juxtapose and combine erudite knowledge, formalized knowledge, abstract knowledge, with empirical knowledge, that is the, the practice, what, what you learn in the practice, and when you combine these two elements, you have the historical wisdom of a struggle, says Foucault. Yes, we need that combination. We, we need to combine this to, to create the kind of, uh, of wisdom, the kind of knowledge that we need for, for the struggle. Um, we cannot say this well in English, because in French and Spanish, uh, you have very clear the difference between um, conocimiento and saber. Uh, the, the, the empirical uh, skills, the empirical knowledge, you, you only have an English knowledge. You, you don't have this distinction. distinction. Uh, and saber, the empirical uh, knowledge, is connected with sabor, that is taste. The, the, these skills, this practical wisdom, has a taste, has, has a flavor. It is connected with, with the reality. And the other is abstraction. Or less. Okay. Thank you, Tom. And let's